Um, we have a special guest with us uh, we want to introduce you to now, um, A.J. Sharma. Um, Sharma, as we call him, okay? Um, registered pharmacist as well as an MBA, so it's a unique combination um, of skills, and it's uh, interesting the conversations he must have in his head about it. Um, he owns and operates Little Acorn Pharmacy right here in Maryland. Um, folks, he's local. He's uh-huh. from the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, excited to talk to him. Sharma, was no able to get you on the phone today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. What's up, Sharma? How are you? I'm doing great. I'm enjoying the snowfall. My kids are outside. My son's about to go to work. <laughs> Very nice. Going to be making some subs today. Very nice. Feeding hungry people. That's what we're all about here, too. Yeah, we were just out on the roads, and in Maryland, they're pretty good. They're just as most of them have been treated. I think uh, tomorrow may be the, the big concern, but, you know, we haven't had, they said, in uh, five years, a snowstorm of this potential. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we need it. Well, awesome. Welcome to the show, and we're, we're looking forward to talking with you, getting to know you. Um, you know, especially being from Maryland, um, you know, tell us what it's like growing up on the Eastern Shore. I, re- I really loved go- growing up on the Eastern Shore. We did a lot of fishing, um, bicycle riding, motocross. It was just a wonderful place to grow up. I um, I, I kind of wish my kids uh, grew up there, too, but I had to move to the big city to go to school. I went to University of Maryland um, for pharmacy school. Uh, but I went to UMBC undergrad, and that was a great school, too. Nice. What made you want to move uh, away from the Eastern Shore? Uh, you know, some people may choose to stay fishing, right? I don't know. Any of your friends stay around, or did everyone? <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, there was opportunities um, at UMBC. I got a scholarship to go there, and my older brother was there. So, you know, I wanted to go to school and be with him, too. And we both really enjoyed uh, University of Maryland. Oh, nice. Really nice school. What did your brother go? Did he go down the same route? Did you guys study the same things? or? No, he, he um, studied computer science and information systems, and they have a great school for that. So now he's he's out west working with a company called it, Intuit. They do make TurboTax software. Yeah, QuickBooks and such, yep. Yeah, huge really, company. Uh, I think a lot of people from Maryland schools do really well because they got a great education here. It's all that, that good growing up on the Eastern Shore, right? It's all that good food and, know. and playing with outdoors, you know? Yeah. I mean, the things oh, he was doing, it was playing with nature, right? You were connected with nature. You were. Uh, it seems more people are trying to get back to nature now and trying to get back to the Eastern Shore, I would think. I think so. It's a great place to retire, and uh, my parents are there. Um, they don't want to leave that area because, you know, my, my parents have been there since 1972. Wow. Which part of, uh, where, which part of Maryland? They're in Salisbury. I remember driving through there, going to Ocean City. I love it. Yeah, it's a great place. It's really nice. They got a great hospital. Uh, cost of living is uh, much lower than here, and um, it's a, it's a great place to live. Sharma, I was reading up about a little bit of your bio when we were starting to get to know you. I hear you're also a musician. Yeah, I play the drums. I um, originally went to school um, in engineering and music, and then ended up in pharmacy. I don't know how that happened, but it just did. <laughs> I still play the drums now, and I really enjoy it. How'd we do on our song choice? Oh, it's one of my favorites. Nice. I was singing along with it. Uh, my man. Let me ask you a question. So, uh, is let's get let's get the music buff question out. Are you a uh, are you a Beatles guy or are you a Stones guy? Um, I I would say both. Really? I, I, I've seen the Stones live a couple times. They're great. Um, it's a, you know, you're singing along the whole concert. I saw them in two different decades. And, you know, Mick is running up and down the stage, no matter how old he is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's a one, wonderful uh, a singer, a musician, and I understand that he uh, he does triathlons and used to do triathlons and stuff. He's really in great shape. Yeah, that's one advantage the Stones have is they can perform live today, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> whatever's keeping them going, perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. How about drummers? Do you have a favorite drummer or someone that inspired you? I know I, I used to um, be a drummer, I mean, back when I was in, I think, 6th uh, or 7th grade. 
and I had a, a, a drummer that was in our, our same grade, John Lampkin, and he was amazing. Uh. He was so amazing, he made me quit drumming. <laughs> <laughs> made you question your choices? He, I was like, I'm not, I don't, I'm not gifted like this guy. Right. Um, but who did you look up to, Sharma? Any drummers you know, growing, at you? Growing up, uh, Neil Peart was a great drummer I used uh-huh. to listen to. Um, I, I listened to just as many jazz drummers, too, so like... I would listen to old vinyl like uh, Max Roach and a lot of uh, a lot of jazz drummers. Um, they just they are a different style, but I mean you need a lot of different styles uh, to put in your vocabulary when you're playing the drums because something you might have picked up jazz drumming might fit into a rock and roll phrase you're playing, or if you're playing with a blues musician, you might be able to use a phrase that you learned a long time ago playing jazz or heard one of the jazz greats playing, and uh, it just fits right in. I can see the correlation. I mean, you have to be, uh, you have to have a good rhythm, and you have to be meticulous in what you do. So I can see the correlation of how you took your, your love for music into what you do professionally, right? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, what I do professionally is a lot like cooking. Mm-hmm. I make compounds for people. Uh, the doctor pretty much says uh, what they want in the compound and we formulate the compound so it gets uh, absorbed in your skin or, you know, through your, uh, in your mouth or, or you're swallowed like a capsule. So we make things that um, are available, are not available, sorry, on the market, and we make them so that they, we can uh, give them to you so you, you get the correct dose like the doctor wanted you to. That's important. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand what exactly a compounding pharmacy does and what makes that different is, uh, is unique. And what scenarios come up that someone would need um, or could use a, a compounding pharmacy? Most commonly, I would say it's an oral dose for a child. Um, hmm. Saying your child needs a dose of medication and it only comes in, say, 100 milligram tablets. But the doctor says, oh, man. If I give your child a 100-milligram tablet, you know, that's going to be too high of a dose. So what are we going to do? He'll call a compounding pharmacy, and a compounder will either uh, get that chemical uh, and provide it, like, say, 5 milligrams and put it in a liquid so they can, uh, they can take it by mouth. And we flavor it so that a child would like it. Uh, so it's not just about the chemical itself. You have to make it what's known as pharmaceutically elegant. Hmm. And pharmaceutically that, elegant. I want to write that that's down. That's a word that old compounders use to say, hey, the, the cream looked great. The production was great. How you gave it uh, to the customer was great. Uh, that's a pharmaceutically elegant product. Wow. And that is very, very important in pharmacy. Hmm. Now that's a that's a good topic, and and to translate it into in my world back in the day, instead of um, it would you know in the software world, it was a complete product or a whole product. It wasn't just the specific code base. It was the way it was delivered, how it was delivered, the intention of everything. Right. Right. I agree. Yeah. Right. That's a good analogy. Nowadays, you might find that in. Uh, I think the people that do it the best are probably like Apple, and. Um, People have learned from Apple, and innovators have learned from them uh, to make something so easy to use that anyone can use it. Um, And sort of something that's been on my mind about potency and absorption. Um, It was one of the the details when we were formulating our product to decide, you know, what concentration do we want it? And I understand... Uh, that the potency does impact how well or not well or effic- how effective a product is regardless of what it is. Can you talk to that for a minute and, and sort of explain how potency does impact uh, the potential interaction and how the body uses it? Well, there are um, many different products out there. Um, and you can have a product that has a strong concentration uh, now, the problem is some products have a concentration they say that is high, but it's not tested. Uh, so they can say, like, the concentration is 10 milligrams per half an ml. If you have a concentration of 10 milligrams per half an ml and it's not tested um, as such, 
then your body is actually getting much less of a concentration. The delivery and what it is delivered in is also very important. Uh, oil, uh, generally in CBD, is uh, much more helpful in delivering than a water-based product because it, it goes through the uh, epithelial cells and underneath the tongue. So in that respect, when you have an oil-based product, it works much better than a water-based product. Hmm, that's a good point, and and that was sort of what I was um, I was really interested in because we got a lot of questions about um, us offering different products, and we've chosen um, our specific oil extract uh, for the ability for it to absorb underneath the tongue, which uh, which is a good way of absorbing um, versus uh, ingesting it and being on your skin. A lot of people would ask us, "Will I fail a drug test if I use your product?" And we've always said, well, if you put it on your skin, the, even if it has high THC, it won't absorb into your bloodstream. Um, but if you ingest it, on, if you put it under your tongue or eat it, it could get into your bloodstream for a test. Mm -hmm. I think that's really how it comes up, right, Max? That's how it comes up, yep. Well, that's true. It uh, does get in your bloodstream. Now, and, does it um, not get in your bloodstream through a cream, like when you put it topically? It all depends on what. Uh, the device is what kind of cream it is. Hmm. Uh, when we compound, we have creams that go uh, just uh, on the uh, very outer parts of your, your skin and then some that go all the way through your skin so that uh, it goes into your, your, um, into your blood. Oh, interesting. It, it's absorbed much better that way. And that would be uh, like suppose if we're giving an estrogen or a testosterone, we want that to go through the skin. Okay. But if you, or, or a pain medicine, uh, we want that to go through the skin. Uh, but if you're treating the skin, like say for a rash, you don't want the medicine to go through the skin. You want it to treat the skin itself. So you don't want a product uh, that's going to go all the way through the skin in that case. Fascinating. Okay. So it's it's one of those things where a lot of times we want an easy answer to complex questions. Nothing's easy. You know what I mean? Um, I do want to get to a caller. We have uh, Vicky on the phone. Oh, right? all right. That's my wife. So Sharma, she's been bugging me all week because she knew that you were coming on the show. So she, you have a, a I would I don't want to call it small. I don't mean to put it down, but you have a, like a, a family owned mom and pop type of uh, a pharmacy, right? That's right. Right. So the natural question that we always have, and I'm sure a lot of people have, is, you know, why would you go to a, 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 you know, a small pharmacy like that versus going to the big Walgreens and such? And my wife is on the phone because she actually worked for a small pharmacy when she was a teenager. So you just told him why? You just told her the question? Well, right? no, no, no. She hasn't asked the question <laughs> oh, okay. yet. She All works right. for a small <laughs> pharmacy and she wants to ask you a question. <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, that, um, Hi. Nice to hear. Hi, how are you? Can you guys, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Hey, this is Vicki. Hi, Max. Hi, Steven. Hi, Mrs. Mailsack. <laughs> so nice to meet you, Mr. Sharma. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being on the show today. And um, I just wanted to call in to say hi and um, tell everybody that it's so beautiful outside. And Max <laughs> Steven went out in the snow um, to bring this wonderful show to, to everybody. So, um, But my question is, I just um, wanted to say that I relate to... Um, Sharma, can I call you Sharma, Mr. Sharma? Yeah, you can call Sharma. me Sharma. You can call me AJ. Sharma. Um, like Max said, when I was a teenager, I worked at a local pharmacy. Shout out to Charles Mead Pharmacy in go. Ruxton, Maryland. Um, <laughs> and there, it was like a local pharmacy, uh, mom and pop, uh, owned by uh, a gentleman named Bernie. And Bernie was like the celebrity in the town because back then, Everybody would come to the pharmacy, and they would go to the lunch counter, which is where I worked, and get their soda pop and their milkshakes, and then they would go and talk to the pharmacist. And they would talk to him about all sorts of things related to their ailments and medication, but they also trusted him so much that they would, you know, chat with him about everything under the sun. So my question is, you know, now in this day and age with, like, Rite Aid and uh, Walgreens and all these, you know, the big retailers, um, you know, they have a consultation window, but every time I go there, nobody's actually there. Nobody goes there to consult. But with this, 
you know, mom and pop local pharmacy, um, the customers would go and, you know, talk to their pharmacist. So I'm just curious, do your customers and patients, I don't know what you call them, but customers, I guess, do they come in and are they looking for alternative uh, methods to treat some of their ailments, such as, you know, use of CBD? And, you know, does CBD come up and what kind of questions do they ask? What are they curious about? And also, uh, how do you advise them? Great. So, well, yeah, we, in small pharmacies, we get to know people a lot better. I have some of my best friends are actually, they started out as my customers. I worked, for, I worked um, in other pharmacies, uh, like for the big chains, for many years, and uh, I saved up money and then opened up my own store five years ago, and uh, I'm not looking back. The, the big stores, uh, one thing for sure, uh, is a battle of attrition. They hire a lot of pharmacists, and they go through a lot of pharmacists because um, they do so many prescriptions that they, those poor pharmacists has no time to... Uh, talk to their customers and get to know them. And mm-hmm. they're just really worried about uh, making sure someone doesn't get the wrong medication uh, because they're, you know, checking hundreds and hundreds of prescriptions. So uh, that's a that's a big deal for pharmacy presently. Uh, I get lots of questions about what should I take as far as nutritionals and as far as weight loss and about CBD. Uh, CBD, I think, I wish had come around about 25 years ago uh, because a lot of the people that have arthritis now and then in their 60s and 70s didn't have a chance to take it in their 50s and 60s because CBD wasn't around. And now it is, and we know that it really helps for inflammation. So inflammation is not a simple thing. There's many different parts to it. And um, CBD has been effective for inflammation. I wish that uh, it had been around for 25 years, maybe when Max and Steven were just teenagers. (laughs) They could have have made their CBD oil back then. Amen. But the thing ends the CBD by now. Just want to remind the audience, uh, if you're just joining us, we're talking to A.J. Sharma. He's a pharmacist um, and a, and a, a fantastic guy. And um, we just got through some questions. And do we have anybody else queued up? Thank you, Vicki Sobel, for the wonderful question. Yeah, thanks, Thank Vicki. Yeah, Max and I were busy with THC 25 years ago. That's right. Um, and, and didn't have aches and pains at that time of the physical nature, so we were, we were treating other issues. That's um, right. <laughs> anyway, we do have another caller. Speaking of my childhood, my mom's on the phone. Yeah, it's a family um, affair today. I love it. Hey, Sharma. And, and uh, we, have, we have my mother, Janet. Janet Wallman, hello. Hello. Hi, Miss Janet. How are you? I am fine. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be on here with your son. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I listen to his show every week. He and Max do a great job. Thank you. And I had a question for you about a medic uh, interaction of a medication that I take every day. Be- um, sure. I had breast cancer five years ago, and so I'm still on letrozole. And sure. I want to know if there's any drug reaction interaction with that and the CBD that I take every day. <laughs> So CBD is metabolized. That means uh, when it goes into your, your system, uh, the body gets rid of it, per se, uh, through your liver. Okay. So there are certain enzymes that uh, function in your liver to do that. And what I'd have to know first is um, letrozole, uh, what enzymes actually metabolize it. That means what enzymes take care of it so that it can get rid of it out of your body. Okay. And then find out. So CBD does have interaction. Um, I would have to actually look up the letrezole, and I can get back to you and find out exactly what happened. And this is okay, because I wasn't sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't <laughs> think there was an interaction with it, but I, I really always had that question. and wasn't, didn't know whether... Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> and, yeah, well, the, the, the other side of the question, which would be, um, what enzyme does CBD interact with? And oh. um, maybe that could also be another. Because what I've heard and what Max and I tell people is if your drugs say that they interact with grapefruit, 
that that's a similar enzyme. Right. That's exactly right. Because um, that uh, has simil- similar effects in the, in the liver. As well, I was told I take Lipitor for cholesterol, and I was also I was told to take that, you know, don't take it together with the CBD. So I take that in the morning, and then I, don't, I use the CBD at night before I go to bed. So actually, the cholesterol medicine should be taken in the evening. Um, and I would just say, um, as long as you're taking both of them simultaneously, ask the doctor to check your levels because your levels actually, uh, you won't need as much of the Lipitor, the Torvastatin, uh-huh. as you did previously to taking CBD because the CBD actually slows the Lipitor's um, metabolism. Ow. So it, it leaves your body a little bit slower if you're taking CBD. Now, if you take CBD just every once in a while. No, I take it usually every night something. before I go to, to go to bed. As do I. Okay. It's really effective for me. Sharma, Sharma, we've always told people that if they are on any kind of medication like that, to take the CBD either two hours before or after. Is that that sort of in line with what you say? That is, except for drugs that you would take in the evening. Okay. Um, Like suppose the cholesterol medicines work better because your, your body makes cholesterol at night. So they want you to take cholesterol medicine in the evening time. Uh, so when you take cholesterol medicine and then you take the CBD, it won't make the two hour window won't make a difference. Okay. I see that drug has a long half life. It'll last in your system for about 24 hours. You know, it's Um, interesting. I've been taking the Lipitor for 10 years and was never told that I need to take it at night. So that's something that. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's good. Well, listen, um, uh, Sharma, we have about uh, 30 seconds left, and before we, we go to break again and, and come back with Doc G's Corner, I want to make sure people know how to get in touch with you and where Little Acorn Pharmacy is so they can continue the conversation with you as needed because, um, you know, you really provide some sound advice here, and I, I think a lot of people could benefit from it. Sure. Yes, we are in Silver Spring. I've been there for five years. Um, we have a drive through right now, which is very important during COVID. Uh, I haven't opened the front end of the store up. So we're at the next traffic light away from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, It's 11161 New Hampshire Avenue. And uh, actually there's a lot of people from the FDA that come and shop there. And um, they're always giving us information and we give them information. And occasionally I take a few of them on to be students to learn how to compound. That's great. And a phone number for you? Uh, it's 301-592-0060. Thank you, Sharma. We appreciate you.